Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. Now today we have a very inspiring story to tell you. And what better way to celebrate the International Day of the Girl Child. Now just in case you know that young teenager who think who thinks her life is messed up because of drugs or addiction or rape or trafficking or whatever the case may be. We have a young woman who has seen all that and more. And she's risen from all this rubble and dirt that life has thrown at her. And she's now one of Australia's most inspiring and influential speakers. Today we have Lisa Pavlakos with us and she's coming to share with us her journey of how she found a diamond weaving. Thank you so much for joining us, And you're a Lisa. millionaire entrepreneur, and I Thank think you. that is so fantastic to know as well. Good Thank to have you. you. Thank you. I struggle actually with the word millionaire entrepreneur because I really don't think that that defines a person. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I try not to say that because, yeah. <laughs> Fair, no, but it's good. It's good. That's a good mindset to have. Yeah. So yeah, welcome. Yeah. But thank you so thank much. Thank you for so being much for here. having me on the thank show. You for joining us. Thank this you. is your first time in Nigeria. Uh, no, it's my second time in Nigeria. And how's it been for you? It's fantastic. Uh, well, we just, I just experienced being on a motorcycle at this late hour, and that was really cool. So much fun, <laughs> you know. But life is about living, and life yeah. is about experiencing. And I can say so far, in this journey of becoming an a keynote speaker, I have experienced so much, and life has been quite good. You know, when you amazing. experience things, it makes you a lot richer. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And today we are lucky because we get to hear your story. And reading through your bio, I was so I was so intrigued because it's such a it's such an influential story without even knowing the full story yet. So yeah. Lisa, you know what? The floor is over to you. We okay. want to know all about you. Right. And starting from the very beginning. Absolutely. Right. I'll try not to take too long though, but so I grew up um from a family filled with love. Um but unfortunately, my parents were both quite busy. You know, my dad was a successful uh, radiographer and my mom was a famous pastry chef. So they were working a lot. So they entrusted me with my uncle. But unfortunately for me, my uncle from a young age, from the age of six, was doing things to me as uh, doing things to me that no child should have to endure. So I suffered uh, sexual abuse from a very young age. At 14, I I was raped from my first cousin. At 15, I fell into depression, not knowing what depression actually was. All I knew was that I had this intense need to want to end my life, so I, I tried various attempts to commit suicide. None of those attempts worked, so at, at 17, I ran away from home and then became homeless. So. I left the comforts of my home to literally live on the streets with no support whatsoever. By the time I was 17 and a half, I fell into a relationship that was not healthy for me because I was so vulnerable and I was needing a lot of love and validation. This guy was so violent that he would belt me and beat me up for no rhyme or no reason. Uh, on my 18th birthday, he gifted me with a, a really, really hard hit. And what that did was it actually broke the right-hand side of my face. So if you look at me closely, you'll see that my face is actually not aligned. One cheekbone is higher than the other. I have a metal plate holding the cheekbone and my eye socket in place. I worked really hard to break away from that relationship because I knew the level of domestic violence was going, you know, harder and harder and eventually I would be killed. So I left that relationship and said, well, what can I do to make my life different? Okay, I'm gonna go to school and I'm gonna enroll myself into a course so that um, I can perhaps better understand people. So I enrolled myself into psychology um, because I wanted to understand how people think and why I made decisions the way I made them and more importantly why my parents didn't stand by me at all even though I knew they loved me. So um, I went to school and school was good but unfortunately for me more bad luck um, striked. I was walking home from school when I was abducted by an absolute total stranger because I didn't know I was being followed taken away for more than eight hours, tortured and almost murdered. Uh, this was probably the worst experience I had ever faced in my life. And I'll be very honest with you, I still cry about it till today because 
you can never erase these kind of things. Like it's different when someone you know abuses you. It it doesn't make it right, but when a total stranger kidnaps you and uh, has you in a very vulnerable place where he's about to murder you and he gives you your last rights as he's about to kill you, you know, it's something that keeps playing in my mind over and over again. But it's something that's also propelled me to be the human rights supporter or human rights activist that I am today, yeah. to empower people. I have almost lost my voice, you know, listening to this, because Honestly. this is such a heart-wrenching story on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's really encouraging to see that one person could have gone through all this and emerged to be the amazing person that you are today. But I want to take you back on your journey. Yes. Let's go back to when you were 14 and you were being raped by your first cousin. What was the first line of action? What did you wish your parents did differently? I wish that my parents would not have blamed me because I know my dad, he called me a prostitute, a prostitute for sleeping with my uncle and sleeping for my, with my cousin. And I was innocent, you know, none of it was my fault. So that was really harsh. I, I wish that my parents would have supported me and defended me, but unfortunately that's just not how it, it went down. Wow. And the second part that I'll take us back to is your story with your experience with domestic violence as well. And of course that has a serious effect on your mental health. Yeah. Aside from depression and feelings of suicide as well, did you, did you have any other bad mental health effects, any anxiety? Well, not, Sorry, and how not, did you, not how so did you much, cope with it at the time? At that time, not so much with the domestic violence. I think after I got kidnapped, I started suffering post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll be honest, I still suffer from it. Mm. But, you know, being in Lagos and being on a motorbike at, you know, this, this hour of the night was such an amazing feeling because I actually felt like I was living, you know. Um, I'm quite blessed because I'm surrounded by so many positive people that take care of me now, so I'm really, really lucky. But at that time, it was really difficult. I was just wanting to end my life all the time because there was no reason for me to live. After the kidnapped, about a year later, um, I gave birth to a child from rape. He's now 20 today, and uh, he is my everything, and I must say, it was when my son Adam was born um, that I decided to change my life for the better because regardless of how my son was conceived, it wasn't his fault at all. And I think what I want to do is change the stigma of how people view children born from rape. Yeah. And at the time, I'm sure there might, there might have been thoughts of you terminating this pregnancy because yes. you just didn't know who... How you were going to deal with seeing this child that reminded you every day of what you had been through. Yes. So what would you say encouraged you to still keep your baby? And I'm asking this because I know there will be several young girls that have been raped and that will get pregnant from being raped. We talked about teenage preg pregnancy earlier. And then they will consider the thought of killing the baby. So you kept yours and now you look back and you, you realize it was the best decision of your life. Yes. What would you say kept you from aborting your baby at the time? I knew that if I didn't have him, I would probably die. Um, I felt from the time that he was in my stomach that there, was a, that there was a being that loved me and needed me. And it also gave me a sense of responsibility to need to be mature and then in turn start to take care of this baby, yeah. which meant also taking care of my life. I say out to all the girls out there that's you know, watching this show today, that if you are, um, that if you're falling pregnant, if you're falling pregnant and, you know, you ask yourself whether you should keep the baby or not keep the baby, I mean, you have to do what's right for you. But the thing is, when you bring a life out into this world, you need to be responsible for this baby because you made a choice to keep this baby. You might not have made a choice to fall pregnant, but you've made a choice to keep this baby, which means that you need to do everything in your power to create economic growth for yourself so that you can then take care of this baby. That's really important. That is very sound advice. Very, very sound advice. Now, let's also touch on the addiction side of things. Yes. How did you fall into and how did you rise out of drug addiction? Well, because I was being 
abused so much, the only way I knew how to numb my pain was to take drugs. And of course, when you're living on the streets, especially where I come from in Australia, drugs is just out there. And so I end up, you know, getting into cocaine, speed, uh, ecstasy tablets, and it all felt good at that time because it numbed my pain. But what people need to understand, and this is what I understood, that this is also a false sense of happiness. Um, if you need to take something to, to numb your pain or just to be happy for that moment, well, then you're not really happy. I didn't want to lose my child, so I decided before I got caught or before my baby was taken away from me, I needed to change my life. So I worked really hard with no support to kick off the drug habit. So you did this by yourself without going to rehab? Totally by myself. Wow. That's that's totally so by it, it took sacrifice because anyone that knows drugs, if you take an ecstasy tablet, you can be the best dancer. Like you will just dance really fast. The music sounds really good. You just have this feeling of euphoria all the time. Mm. When you stop taking drugs, it's like it's a crash landing to the ground. Or all, all of a sudden you're just the worst dancer and you can't hear the music. But if you need to take something to f have that feeling of euphoria, then you're not really happy. You're not really living, right. living a life. Let's look at the tipping point for you. Now, at 23, you organized the Miss India pageant, yes. which raked in over $100,000 yes. in ticket sales. Beyond that, you've done several amazing things. You've been featured on CNN, inspiring women to become thoughtful entrepreneurs. And also, you have your two-minute videos that you do as well, you know, power-packed motivation that leave people feeling inspired. Yes. How... What was the turning point from this Lisa that was addicted and this Lisa that was, you know, just had a baby that she was still trying to understand the concept of motherhood? What was the turning point for you? At what point did you find yourself on this other path, yes. this other positive path? Well, when I decided to start Miss India International for Australia, um, I felt the power, especially when I was on stage and I took a bow uh, after the show was finished and I had made a hundred thousand dollars in ticket sales i felt this huge uh, accomplishment sense of accomplishment so that business then went on to another business which was a, a cafe that i took over made it really successful and then i went on to starting up a tailoring franchise and i had five stores one of them is still running miss india international i sat in front of beyonce because she was my client jay-z michael buble he named my fourth child you know, got major contracts like the Grand Prix, the Australian Open. And even though I was making a lot of money, I knew that I was really unhappy because every time a woman got murdered, every time um, a child was abused, I felt like I wasn't living my purpose. You see, we go through things in life, and if we don't want to take the lessons learned to empower someone else from the lessons we've learned, well, then what's the point of living? So I decided to write a book. Um, about my story to leave some sort of legacy behind, at least for my children. And this book is set to be published in, within the next year or so, published worldwide. And so I became a speaker then. And being a speaker it hasn't been an easy journey because, you know, people want to hear speakers speak about people who climb mountains um, and just um, do extraordinary things. Whereas I'm speaking about rape and domestic violence and kidnap. I'm speaking about topics that people find it a little bit uncomfortable to hear. But the thing is, is that if you are really passionate about a cause, then, then fighting for it, working towards it, is not a hard task at all. So I stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning working, making calls all over the world of who wants to book me as a speaker because ultimately it's not about the money but it's about how many people I can inspire. Absolutely and that's exactly what you're doing. In the past 20 minutes alone I have been so inspired and I want to thank, thank you, you um, for having your courage to share your story with the world and for making that decision to make that your life. I think it's a very brave decision to make in this day and age, and I really want to thank you for thank that. You. Now, there are a lot of girls out there in Nigeria who are unfortunately extremely vulnerable. They're left in very hard-hitting situations that often at times we, as a society, close our eyes to and we shouldn't. 
What advice would you give to young, vulnerable girls out there watching this show right now who don't necessarily know what the way forward is? Children, I want to tell you something, okay? And I hope you're looking at me right now. If you have gone through something that is hurtful to you, whatever it is, whether it's mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, to girls, to boys, to anyone that is not what we call, you know, it, it, someone who, I don't know, just anyone out there, not just girls. I know it's Girls International Day, but anyone that's been abused, there is help out there. There is support out there. We have the internet. We have social media. There are plenty of services. If you feel that it's not in your country, then you can always reach out outside of your country. You can always come onto my website. You can always find me, find my team. And if you need support, we will help connect you with support around the world. So that's not a problem. First things first is forgive yourself for what's happened to you because it's not your fault. Number two, try and move forward. Move forward through economic growth. Move forward by studying. Move forward by making your life better because ultimately you are responsible for your life doesn't matter what happened. You are responsible to rescue yourself. Nobody rescued me. I rescued myself with the faith in the divine. And if you are created by something so magical like the divine, then surely this magic is within you. And you, no matter where you are in Africa, in Nigeria, in the world, you can achieve anything. And I believe in you. Such a fantastic piece. I, I couldn't have said it better. And I'm still going to ask you to do one more thing. Now, your first son, Aidy. Now, you're a mother of five, six, five, six children? Five children. Five children. Oh, are you sure I'm not prophesying for a sixth one? <laughs> no, no. Okay, you're a mother of five children. Well, after your first son, Aidy, I'm sure you'd had to build his self-esteem to a point where he got so confident of the fact that you shared the story of, his concept, of, of how he was conceived and he doesn't feel some type of way. Unfortunately, we live in a world where everybody's hurt people, hurt people. They're looking to prey on any story or any vulnerability that they see. And I'm sure you've raised a young man that is confident and that loves himself absolutely. Now, a lot of the mistakes many people make starts from a place of lack of self-love. So to a young girl or young boy watching you that has not learned to accept themselves, that have not learned to love themselves, what would you say to them? I would have to say embrace your past, embrace your history. My son is 20 years old today, and my son also has autism. And, um, you know, I have to remind him every day, Adam, you have Asperger's. It's okay to have Asperger's. Just rise above the stigma of what people think you should be like. You are capable of doing anything and everything. So with me having been kidnapped, I embrace the fact that this is what I've been through, that I've faced so many different adversities in your life. I say to you girls to embrace the things that you've been through because if you've come this far in life, you can get through anything. Trust me. You Fantastic can. words of advice and no better way to wrap up today's show now, with the words that Lisa Pavlikos has shared with us, it's been an inspiring a little over 20 minutes here. And Leila and I are living, feeling better than we came. But thank you so much for thank joining us. Thank you so us. much. To enjoy more of this, our will go get videos when you just watch. Press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.